All right, where is, where'd my chat go? Well, it's 520. There we go. All right, um, I was hating what was going on, so I had to recreate my drawing really quick on break to a Word document. Can you guys see that okay? Wow, that's, that looks different. Does it? It's supposed to look the same. <laughs> Can you explain the main air bleed again real quick? Yeah, this is my float. Okay, so here's my, my main air bleed is over here. And we're just going to talk about what happened <laughs> when, it, when it's running, because I think that'll be, that'll be easier. Okay, so without the main air bleed, it, it, the carburetor works. The, the Venturi works, it's pulling air through the Venturi, it creates a low pressure, and it's going to suck the fuel out. All right, but the problem is the fuel is going to be in these giant globules, if you will. And the, so when you get the giant globules, you don't have, uh, um, what do I want to say, you, you don't have enough surface area, it doesn't evaporate fast enough, it doesn't mix well enough. So. Uh, you have all of those issues. So to solve that and to get rid of uh, the surface tension so it flows much easier, we want to introduce little air bubbles into the fuel. And that's all we want to do is put little air bubbles in there. And so to do that, we drill a passage off of the side here and run this little passage over here and put a little hole up here in the top. Uh, now, that hole has to be higher than the fuel level. If it's not, then when it's, the engine's not running, when the engine's not running, there's no air in here. It actually fills up full of fuel because you just have to think about everything static. There's no suction. There's no... Um, you can't see your marker on this screen. Oh, okay. Whoa, you can't see the arrow going around? Well, that could be a problem. I can't solve that one. That sucks. Guess I got to go back to my other thing. Let's see. Back to here. Well, now I see your arrow moving. Which screen are you looking at? The Microsoft Word. Okay. Or I see your cursor right there. Yes, yeah, moving. Okay. Uh, how about now? I'll take that as a no. No, no. it's static. Oh, it. now it's moving. Okay, yeah. so you can see the pen, but you can't. So I use my mouse. Okay, so this. This, uh, this air bleed has to be higher than the fuel level because when the carburetor is not running and it's static and it's sitting there on the ramp, because there's no suction going through here and it's not sucking the fuel up and it's not sucking the air, everything goes static and the fuel comes here and the fuel's gonna find its own level. It's actually gonna fill up to right here. So this is just gonna be full of fuel when it's sitting there. So it has to be up here. So, but anyway, the air bleed does all those things. And that's why it's back here behind the Venturi, hidden. And that's the way they do it in the carburetor. They hidden. So uh, hopefully that, does that explain things to you guys a little bit better? Hopefully. Yeah. Okay. So you said, so I can see that the holes are in the, what is it called? The main discharge nozzle area? Well, these those, those are bubbles. yellow things, that represents bubbles. Oh, okay. So it literally just sucks the air with, the fuel. Yes. So this right here, this okay. is this is bubbles, bubbles and fuel. Gotcha. And, and what really happens up here is uh, uh, this kind of is closed off a little bit. Some of them this close a little bit. Some of them they'll put a few little holes right here for the fuel to come out like that. Um, but otherwise, that's that's all. This is all solid. All right. So where we'll go back to smooth draw. All right, create some more. So we got that one. Let's see. Um, all right, so the question that I could ask you is what happens if the air bleed is blocked? So what happens? What happens if the air bleed is blocked? And these are the things that I'm going to ask you when uh, we're in lab, uh, when we're in lab and, so I'm trying to do things, how do I meet you guys again? I don't remember. When we're in lab and I ask you a question, you're, you're gonna be responsible 
for having to figure out what everything does. Well, you know, I'll say, what if this hole is blocked? What if this hole is blocked? What if this hole is blocked? What if, and there's all these holes all over the carburetor. So, but right now we just got this. What happens if that is blocked? Well, we, we go back. We can't see it. will run richer. Okay, so is it gonna run richer? That's actually a, um, I wonder if that's, I think that might be a Q&A question. Um, so, well, answer, no more suction is acting on the, so more suction is acting on the discharge nozzle. I'm not going to read that. Let me go back here. So what happens if this is blocked? We just go back to what the air bleed does. All right. We're going to get larger globules of fuel coming out, which means less surface area, which means the fuel is not going to evaporate. So it would, in fact, be a rich mixture because the air is not going to surround it. We're going to, we're going to end up getting too much fuel inside of the... Um, cylinder and it is a rich mixture at that point so Kevin? yeah how, how's how does it get uh, blocked is there anything preventing from oh, getting blocked or not easy get blocked it's a tiny little hole all these holes are very small the main discharge nozzle is the only one that's actually a decent size hole but all it takes is a little bit of dirt a bug um, leaf rollers are a huge problem with aircraft it's some sort of bug and they they uh, actually chew up and roll leaves inside of, of like pedo tubes and all kinds of stuff. So. I remembered my question. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so um, remember um, you sent an email saying that the videos are going to be on Canvas? I they did are. not see it. What's that? You don't see it? Yes. All right. Let's see. It's off the subject, but... Yeah, I know that's what I tried to ask before Canvas. you started. It's all right. Let's make sure. I think I got them posted on YouTube, but. Yeah, I saw them on YouTube, but I didn't see the course lectures tab. Right course lectures, start here, course lectures. See that? Yeah. Course lectures. There you go. Eight, oh, part one, okay. two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And there's a link to YouTube. So I'm just going to put them like that. I can put them up pretty fast here. Okay. Yeah. I see it now. So Kevin. Yeah. This, there's no any kind of filtering, right? Um, are we talking about canvas now or here? No, no, no. I'm just going back to. Back to here. Is there, no, there really isn't. For these little holes, there isn't. Um, I will let you in on a little secret in that um, like one of the carburetors, the way it works is the, the air has to go through a passage, hit something, turn around and make a 90 degree turn inside of here so that it would knock out any dirt when it makes that 90 degree turn. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So as an a &P, can you build, re rebuild the carburetors? Absolutely. You can overhaul is the term we'd want to use, but can you over? Yes, you can. As long as you have the proper equipment and training. So, all right, where am I now? What happens if the air bleed is blocked? Well, let's see, that'd be, um, what do I want to say? Um, it actually creates more, well, the stu suction stays the same, but you kind of go back to the straw analogy. So if you're drinking out of a straw at the restaurant and you're enjoying your soda, and uh, I reach over and poke a hole in your, in your, so in your straw because you went to the bathroom, are you going to get more or less soda out of it? Well, you're, you're actually going to get soda and air, and that's not going to be very fun. So, um, so let me see. Um, so we just go back to have the surface tension issue. Um, the air bleed actually helps lift out the fuel, uh, provides a more uniform mixture, so we're going to get rid of all of that stuff. We're recording here. Yeah. Oh, there we go. There's a question. Oops, I just muted everybody. So if you have a question, go ahead. Uh, do I do it in the field or is it common? Well, I did it. I had a, I worked for a repair station and uh, we did a lot of carb overhauls. Uh, okay, so can you overhaul a carburetor field? Yes, you can. Are there many moving parts? 
pretty much just two. So is it hard? Eh, I'm going to say no, it's not hard. And now I'm a question talker. Hate that. Okay. So, but what happens? How many, what is my redundancy for carburetors? And I will tell you the answer is there isn't one. So if you do a carburetor overhaul and you make a mistake, that aircraft will stop running. And that is a problem. So do you want to overhaul a carburetor in the field is a question you need to ask yourself. Uh, it's, it is, this is a high risk environment with carburetors because they can be a little finicky and, and you'll see, there, but there's not much to them. So um, I don't have a problem with it, but that's because I have the experience in doing them. Uh, all right, moving on. Let me see. Where am I? Uh, make this five then, five. Main metering jet, main metering May metering jet. Well, we actually talked about this last time. I didn't draw in my drawing very well, but if we were to do this, and I just have this, oops, I gotta remember, you can't see that, you can see this one. All right, if I've got this, this pipe here, this tube, and there's nothing restricting the fuel going through here. So it's just gonna take as much as it possibly can. So at some point, we have to be able to restrict this. So I want a very small eraser. And Erase that, there we go. And so I want to make sure that, so I have to restrict it. So the way this can be restricted is a lot of books will show it, put a little restriction down here, let's color that in. So it restricts it right here. Another way to do it is we could put some sort of cap here and drill, probably isn't gonna work, drill a very small hole right here. So right there's my main air bleed now, so that it is, got a very, not the main air bleed, why did I say that? Um, there we go. So I have the main metering jet. And so the main metering jet is gonna be the orifice, a calibrated orifice that restricts the amount of fuel that can come out through here. So if I have this carburetor, and let's say I was running it on a very small engine, but I needed to take it off my very small engine, put on an engine that was just a little bit bigger. Well, the things I would want to do, number one, is I would have to change out to a slightly larger Venturi probably, but I would want to take this and make it bigger, rejet it. Now, if you, anybody's into like motorcycles or uh, off-road vehicles, like I have my, my Honda, I would rejet it when I would go up to high altitude. And so what that meant is if I was riding it down here in the valley, I had it tuned so that it would not be too rich down here, run just perfect around here. Then I would go up in the mountains and go riding somewhere. And when I would get way up to high altitude, the air is much thinner. So the same thing applies. So I've got air being drawn through the Venturi and it does volume not weight. The Venturi can't, can't compensate for that. So I get the same volume of air coming through, but the air weighs a whole lot less than it used to. So, so now I've got the same volume coming through of air that weighs less, and the carburetor doesn't know any better, so it's just adding the same amount of fuel it always added before. So that is going to make a very rich mixture. So I'm up there riding around, it runs rich. And if you remember the problems with running rich, number one, I'm going to foul spark plugs. Number two, I'm going to lose power. I don't have as much power because I'm running on the rich side of things. I want to get it back towards that best power range, not the super rich mixture. So, but the plus side was I wasn't, I wouldn't get detonation, right? So when I would get up, go high altitude uh, bike riding, I would pull out this little, oops, I can't forget, I would pull out this jet right here and put in one that was slightly smaller to just restrict a little bit of fuel going through here. So now in an aircraft, uh, we have some other means of doing it, but um, we don't read jet for altitude. That just doesn't make sense because they go up and down all the time. So, all right, so we got main metering jet. All right, main metering jet. What is main metering jet? That is a calibrated orifice. calibrated orifice calibrated orifice that meters fuel accurately that meters fuel accurately
accurately based on the pressure differential pressure differential between fuel the fuel bowl fuel bowl and venturi all right so two questions number one Orifice, calibrated orifice, O-R-I-F-I-C-E. Two questions. Number one, what is the pressure differential between the fuel bowl and the Venturi called? Head pressure. Not head pressure. Head pressure is the fuel pressure uh, from an Air elevated tank. Air metering force. Air, what's that? Air metering force. You got it. All right, wait a minute. Fuel meter, yeah. I always have to look. It should be called fuel metering force. Oh, yeah, fuel. My bad. That yeah. was the one with the difference. My bad. Nope. Fuel metering force. And I had another question, but I forgot what it was. Um, based on the pressure. No, nah, don't remember what the question was. All right. And we talked about the float mechanism. Float mechanism, M E C H A N I S M, float mechanism. Well, uh, what does that all do? Well, number one, it controls the level of fuel in the fuel bowl. Controls the level of fuel in the fuel bowl. And the level must be maintained slightly, should it be above or below the discharge nozzle? Below. Thank you, below is correct. Maintain slightly. Slightly below the outlet of the discharge nozzle. Maintain slightly below the outlet of the discharge nozzle. And again, if the fuel level is too high, you're gonna run rich. If it's too low, you're gonna run lean. And what does this float mechanism contain? Contains, well, it contains the float. Contains a float. It has the needle and it has the seat. And I'll put this here and then we'll go back. So fuel, fuel level in bowl is critical. So A too lean, or I could say too low. Too low equals lean, and too high, rich. I can see you guys writing, so. Is it's helpful when you have a your cameras on because I can actually look over and see you guys look at the screen right look at the screen right so I know I got to give you some time I like Christian there he's, he's I see your, uh, is that your ride in the background <laughs> that's pretty sweet that's <laughs> uh yeah it's a uh, thirty five hundred a Dodge a Dodge Ram sweet. Okay, so the float mechanism, we had the, the, the float, the float. Uh, I'll show you some guys some floats. In, in the old Stromberg carburetors, they were made of brass. And uh, as you're gonna find out if you're watching some of the videos, Marvel Shebler, they had some problems. They did brass 
and uh, brass worked great, but then they decided they want to go to a composite. And, and I think it was auto gas or something was eating up that composite. I'm not even sure. But they decided to go away from composite and go to a plastic one. And then the plastic ones were not working out well. They were getting holes. And if you get a hole in the float, the float's going to sink and you're going to run excessively rich. And that is going to be very, very bad. And so they had a problem with that. So they, um, I think they went back to brass for a while. Then there was some ADs on the brass. Now they have a new composite style. But I actually, in, my, in the classroom, I have uh, brass and the plastic ones all full of fuel. So they get little tiny pinholes in them. They fill up full of fuel and then they sink. And that's, that's a bad thing. So, uh, but strong, the old uh, Marvels, sorry, the old Strombergs, they still use brass. That's all they ever had. And the new Marvel Shovelers, they want you to have, which is precision, they only want you to have the uh, composite floats. Uh, how long did it take to go to silicon? Uh, they don't use silicon, oh, well. they're some sort of composite. Uh, I thought it was silicon in, in the video. Uh, it's a composite silicon then, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It took a long time then. They haven't been out that long, uh, I'm less than 10 years. When I stopped doing carburetor overhauls, we were back to brass floats. Uh, we'd been through it all, we went all the way back around to bar brass. So uh, we have the float, we have the arm, and that represents a fulcrum, the point where the arm goes down, this part's gonna come up. This is the needle right here, and then this is the seat. And the seat is something you can actually pull out. Um, all right, I think I have, I've upset J-Rod, so I gotta go back. Uh, needle, a calibrated, I don't know where you're at. J -Rod. Kevin? Yeah. So on the needle there, uh, I watched in the video, there's an O-ring, right? <laughs> and it all depends of um, the thickness of the O-ring also, right? Um, you're watching the old one, right? The old black yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's Is it still the, like that or no? Okay, if the black and white one, that's the old Stromberg one. And yes, I'm going to go back to this picture here. I'm going to get ahead of, ahead of us right now, but if I, if I wanted to change the level of this fuel, I forget, you guys can't see when I do that, change the level of this fuel, and I can't bend anything, this is, this is more representative of the Stromberg style. How could I change the level of the fuel? Well, if I raise the seat up, it means that this is going to shut off sooner. So if I raise the seat, it lowers the level. And the way I would raise this seat up is to put shims under it. And if I wanted it to go, if I wanted the level to be higher, I would want this to plug off later, which means this has to go up more before this hits the seat. So I would take away shims. So it's an, it's an opposite thing. And it's so um, raise the seat to lower the fuel level, uh, lower the seat to raise the fuel level. And I'll write that down. In fact, we're, I'm almost actually kind of right there. That was a pretty good segue. But I'm gonna go back to here. All right, you guys need a little time to write this stuff out? Everybody kind of done. All right, thanks Christian, you can see that. Hey, Robbie's here, all right. All right, good. All right, thanks, Janet. All right, let's go to, I'll make this 0 0.5, 0 0.5, measuring, measuring fuel levels. Measuring fuel levels. All right, so the old-timey Stromberg carburetor, let's see, I wonder if I have a picture of an old-timey Stromberg over here. Carb monkey. There we go. All right, this is the old timey Stromberg carburetor. Um, and we're gonna get into some more of these parts about what this does and what this does and what this does and all that other stuff. This is where the fuel comes in. But here's a picture of it open with the fuel sitting in there. And the Strombergs, you can do this too. Marvel Shovelers, you can't because of the way they come apart. 
so here we have the fuel in here. This right here, that's my a seat where the needle is. Um, this right here is my discharge nozzle. Um, this is, let me think, um, the main metering jet is right here. Um, we have the main air bleed is right here. And that's all we talked about so far. So we have the fuel in here. So we want to, uh, of course, you can't check the fuel level with the, with the seat out. You got to put it all back together and put it back in there. But get rid of this. There we go. Oh, as opposed to, I'll show you this one. There's the newer marble shovelers. So they look a lot different, don't they? All right, so measuring fuel levels. Let's talk about that old timey Stromberg. Stromberg. Oops, Stromberg is with an E, Stromberg with an E. All right, so on this particular carburetor, the, the float and bowl are in the lower half. So the float and bowl are in the lower half. Are in the lower half. All right. Um, according to the manual, I read the manual, this, the, the actual level of the fuel is tested with solvent, with solvent. And the reason why I use solvent is you really don't, don't want to use gasoline uh, because it's, you know, well, because if we go back in the day when, when the period of time where these things were made and mechanics were working on them, everybody smoked. And so they would do, check this while they were smoking. And so uh, that was a bad idea. Uh, and so solvent was the medium to use. So I um, tested with solvent at a specific head pressure. So, um, little buddy. All right, so everybody now knows what head pressure is. Head pressure is the pressure of the fuel that is entering the carburetor from uh, not from not from a fuel pump, but from a tank. So uh, in the directions, it would actually say something. And I forget what it is, but it's like you know you need to put a fuel tank with um, you know, so much fuel. Um, it's something like uh, forty some inches above the carburetor to give you this specific head pressure. So, and then they want you to measure the fuel. Well, there's some tricks to this. So always, always measure the fuel level away from the edge. Not always easy to do, but so what you're gonna do is we'll make a little carburetor bowl right here and I'll put some fuel in there. So we got our fuel in there. And on the edge, I'm gonna exaggerate, we have that meniscus, that's what that's called. So it always kind of rides up like that. So you never want to measure it near the edge. But what we do is we take, I'll make it be red. So we're going to take a depth micrometer and we're going to lay it across here. So I'll make, try and make a depth micrometer. So depth micrometer. And it comes up here like that. And then it's got the thimble that you can screw up and down and you can read all the numbers on just like a regular carburetor, or sorry, like a regular micrometer. But instead of measuring between two things, it's got a pin that comes down. And it's really kind of cool um, what you do is, so you start screwing the micrometer down and the pin goes down, down, down. And you're just gonna watch it with a flashlight. And as you're screwing it down very, very gently, all of the sudden, the fuel just jumps up on it. Like, whoa, what just happened? I mean, it just jumps way up there. Now you're looking at it and you're like, well, a second ago, this pin wasn't even touching the fuel. Now suddenly it's under the fuel. Well, because when you get right up to and touching the fuel, we had the meniscus over here that climbed up the side, which is always like that. It did the same thing. It just jumped up on that needle. We, all you do is you stop and you say, okay, when it jumped up on the needle and it's quite sudden and it's like, whoa, that was really cool. Uh, when it jumps up on the needle, you stop and you read the micrometer and you say, that is the depth of the fuel. And so always measure away from the edge because if you did it during the edge, 
it's actually up higher on the edge. So you got to get out here in the middle, which is easier said than done. And what else can we say here? Um, adjustments are made. Adjustments are made by adding or removing shims uh, from under from under the seat. There you go. Uh, let's see. I'm going to let you catch up while I read uh, our chat. So Hector asks, what do you use to clean them? Um, clean what, Hector? Like the passages and stuff? Yes. Um, carburetor and stuff. Uh, oh, clean carburetors? Well, it depends uh -huh. on what part you're cleaning. So one thing you have to be very careful of with carburetors is you never, ever clean any of the, the small passages out with any sort of wire or by putting anything in there. So you're only supposed to use solvent and compressed air for the little passages. And then for the bowls and stuff like that, you can um, just yeah, brush in the solvent. So. Yeah, what, what kind of solvent though? Is it a specific brand or? Uh, it's changed over the years. Back when I did it, we actually, well, you can still buy carburetor cleaner uh, at a parts store. Um, well, the stuff that we have in the lab, I would use that hot tank over uh, in the corner, not the hot seat, because it'll blow things around a little too much. It's a little harsh. Uh, but uh, the, the pressurized, they're not the pressure, the, uh, the hot tank over in the corner, way back in the corner. Oh, yeah, I'm going to move aside here, provided right, nobody gets angry. All right, good. I was waiting. I was waiting for that one. All right. Okay. Um, what did I say? Oh, add or removing shims. All right. So this is like sub point but behind what I just did. So this is out here and I'll come in one, one. So adding shims raises the seat. Adding shims. Adding shims raises the seat. Raises the seat. Um, but, but a higher seat, higher seat will result in fuel shutting off sooner. So a higher seat will result in fuel shutting off sooner. Which equals lower level. So raise the seat, you lower the level. And the opposite is, well, I can make this one point number two, opposite. So removing shims, removing shims lowers the seat, lowers the seat. So a lower seat, will result in fuel shutting off, will result in fuel shutting off later, which equals um, higher level of fuel. And let's talk, so that's, that's how you're gonna do it on the Stromberg. You're just gonna pull that seat out and go back over here. Not that one. Wrong way. Please stand by while we have technical difficulties. Don't worry about this. I'm just going to edit it out later. All right. So again, here's here's the seat. I, I, you can see it on this one. So here's the seat, and so you can see that there's a cutout here, cutout here for a very large screwdriver that fits in there. And we just pull out the seat, and underneath the seat down there, there's some shims that go in there, and you can buy all kinds of different shim sizes. And so if we raise this seat up, 
then it is going to shut off, the, raise the seat, you lower the fuel. Lower the seat, you raise the fuel. And as far as this one goes, let me see. All right, we talk about this one here. Um, so this one, you can see it's the same thing. We have the fuel bowl is down here. Here's the gasket and the parting flange. So the fuel bowl's down here. So you'd think it's the same way. I don't actually have a picture of this one on the inside, but this kind of explains it a little bit. Um, here's the float, and the float actually hangs off of the top part. So when I pull off this bottom part, this bowl, the float actually stays with the top. So you cannot check the fuel level because the two are separate. So it's actually kind of a, it's a much different process and it's actually much easier to deal with. So I don't think I have a decent picture of that. No, I don't. So it's much easier to deal with and a lot less precise, which is crazy. So the Marvel Shebler, M-A-R-V-E, -E, Marvel Shebler. Shebler. Uh, the float is measured dry on this one. So float is measured dry. Um, and what you do is you actually take the whole body and you'll learn this in lab, but you just flip it upside down and you use a drill bit and you measure the clearance. The clearance. You measure this clearance right here between the parting flange and this with it upside down, you measure how much clearance you is there. You can't see it. You can't see that? What can't you see? See it now? Yeah. Okay, it can work if I got my pen. Okay, so you have this area right here. You just measure that with a drill bit. And it's crazy because it's like, measure near the end of the float bowl and uh, adjust over here as needed. As were the Stromberg, uh, the fuel level is just an exact, I mean, you have a very narrow range and you're always messing with the floats. Honestly, in my shop, to set up the float level in a Stromberg, we would take almost a day with it, you know, set it, check it, set it, check it. Um, I think that was a little excessive. I can show you guys how to do it quite, quite a little faster, but, um, these things, these uh, Marvel shovelers, it's just a few minutes. I mean, you're not done in a few minutes. Uh, you're, you're messing up somewhere. So why do you use a drill bit? Well, um, let me see, let me go back. So Hector, what is the purpose of lapping the seats again to make sure a new one makes good contact? Exactly. You could only lap in the seats, uh, just like we did with valves and seats on cylinders. You can actually do the same thing with the old Strombergs that had steel seats only. These, uh, the newer Strombergs, uh, they use a needle that has a little rubber tip right at the end. Let's go to here. So let me do this. So this little end right there, that's a rubber tip. And you can't lap in rubber. You just destroy it. And the, new, uh, the newer Stromberg seats are the same way. They have little rubber. So you don't lap those in at all. But the old-timey ones you did. And when it comes to measuring all of the stuff on a carburetor, let's see, back up a couple here. Let me see, let's go to, I like this one. All right, look up in here and you can see the actual size of some of those holes. And those are pretty dang small. And that's actually a, a rather large hole for a carburetor. And the way you measure all of these is with drill bits. And the reason why drill bits work so well is because you can actually calibrate it. So um, everything is, is referenced even in the manual with the drill bit size. And what it'll tell you is that, um, well, like a number, number 60 drill bit should fit that hole. And of course, you got to be careful. You don't use the drilly end of the drill bit because you just make it a hole bigger. You use the shank end of the drill bit and you turn it around and you can actually measure the shank end with a calibrated micrometer. That's how you calibrate your drill bit. And then if the manual says like a number 60 should fit and a 59 should not, then you, then you know that it works. But if it says a, uh, a 60 should fit and a, and a 59 should not and a 59 does fit, well, then you got a problem. The hole is too big. And what happens if the hole is too big? Well, then you have to replace that component because as you can see that little tiny hole, it's not like you're going to weld it up and, and, and fix it. 
Um, so how often do I see those holes wore out and no good? Never. Um, like I said, the thing that actually wears out in these carburetors are these throttle shaft bushings. So that little hole doesn't move. Uh, that's attached to that screw right there. That doesn't move. So what moves on the carburetor? This arm. This arm right here and this arm right here. Um, but this arm goes through a bushing that is, it's just different. So this is the throttle. So every time you're in there trying to work the airplane, you, you know, full throttle, idle, idle, full throttle, you know, so it's, it's being moved the whole time. So it wears out the shaft where it goes in through here and where it goes right there that wears out and getting ahead of myself, but this is something you'll have to know. And I will ask you this in orals for sure. I will say what happens if the throttle shaft bushings wear out and that's this space right here. So again, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I want you to think about the fact that when this is bolted up to the engine and it's running, especially at idle, the air right here is under a tremendous amount of vacuum, a lot of vacuum. And if this is under a vacuum and the engine is trying desperately to suck air in, but this, shot, this, this butterfly right here is closed and that's the only little space right there. You can barely see it where it's letting a little bit of air come through, but this engine is dying for air and it's working so hard to suck some air in. It'll find a spot. It'll find it right here and right on this side. And it will suck air right in through these bushings and allow air to get up in here. Now, the thing about that is when you let any air come in through here, it just bypassed the rest of the carburetor and everything that was designed to measure the air coming through. So if you're letting air in and the fuel system doesn't know, you're running lean. And that's what happens to these carburetors. They start running leaner and leaner and leaner, especially at idle. And you're back here adjusting this screw over and over and over. And your problem is actually in these bushings. But we'll, we'll circle back around to that. Okay. Yeah. Would you have to replace the whole top portion? Nope. You can actually rebush them. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, run to me. Here we go. So, Marvel Shuffle. Float is measured dry. Um, so, you, oh, let me go back to here because this is such a great picture. No, it's not. It's going the wrong way. Let me see. Ah, let's use this picture. All right, so I'm gonna, the next thing I'm gonna write down is fuel level is checked with the sight glass. So as I mentioned, I'm going to measure this with a, a, a drill bit, and then the manual tells you to assemble this and put fuel in here, and then it tells you to, to put a, a sight glass. So you get a, put a piece of plastic or glass or something you can see through right here. And then what happens is you put the carburetor on a, on a bench and you fill it full of fuel and this gets full of fuel and the fuel level comes right here. And then you can actually see what the fuel level is like. And you can measure that from here to here when it's outside the carburetor. All right, so float is measured dry. Um, fuel, fuel levels checked with the sight glass. With a sight glass. Um, and adjustments are made. Adjustments, yeah. Oops, that's as far as this goes. Julian, do you need me to get it back? Adjustments are made by bending the float. By bending, by bending the float tab. Float tab. Now I'm gonna put this one. I don't know, it's probably supposed to be five. Um, Never check, C-H-E-C, -E never check. Um, yeah, there's only so much you can actually bend those float tabs. And you, you only have to bend them a teeny tiny little bit. It makes a big difference. Um, even with going back to the old timey one with the shims, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. 
Um, it's a it's a different ratio. I have that written on here. I'm gonna you do that in lab. It's a seven to one ratio, I think. So for every seven thousandths you for every one thousandths you change the the um, sh the, sh the shim you add, you change it like seven thousandths of. But don't quote me on the one to seven. I think it is. Uh, so never check. Never never check. Um, needle and seat. Needle and seat with shop air. And that's kind of my little joke is I, I've ruined a couple of things in aviation because I got a little overzealous with shop air. So uh, everything I've ever broken pretty much involved me and shop air. Um, so we had an, a, an aircraft in the shop and we did an engine overhaul on it. And this was before I was running the engine or accessory shop. So um, I think it was the same guy did the engine and the same guy did the, did the overhaul on the um, carburetor. And the more I think about it, yes, that is correct. So, um, so we get all done with the engine and uh, we hung the engine on the aircraft and you know, we take it outside and we're gonna, we're gonna run up this engine. And this is always a big deal. You know, everybody in the shop gathers around, you know, we're gonna fire up a new engine. There's nothing quite as fun as watching a brand new engine start up. It's got very unique smells to it and everything. And it's just, you know, job well done. So we take this aircraft out, you know, and the guy jumps in and we're all standing there and we goes to start it up. And man, this thing would not start for nothing. I think I finally got it started and it just takes off. And it would just idle way up and come way down. I mean, when I mean idle, it would go really high RPM and then float off to nothing. Then really high RPM, then drop off to nothing. And it just, it, so he'd shut it down and, you know, oh man, there's something wrong with the carburetor. And so, you know, he'd take off the carburetor, take it back to the shop and he'd tear it all apart and, and uh, you know, measure the floats again and do this and all that other stuff and put it back again. I think he must have done this two or three times. So, and as I've said before, you know, knowing what we're talking about now is all about troubleshooting, right? Because any mechanic can just R and R it. And, oops, 520. It's 520. So well, I guess I'll finish my story later. So uh, come back later and uh, thanks Cameron and I'll tell you my story. No. <laughs>